miles north of Concord, where we're going to be hearing from Texas Congressman Ron Paul. He's taking the stage and he'll be joined by his son, Kentucky Senator Rand Paul, at this town hall meeting. I thought after two days of debates, you'd be tired of politics. <laughs> but we're just getting started. We're looking forward to Tuesday for sure. But before we get started, I want to introduce some, several members of my family. This is my wife, Carol. You, you might have received uh, some greetings from her. She uh, sent out a lot of cookbooks here lately. But also, uh, daughter-in-law Peggy is here. And, and her daughter, Linda. And... We also had the arrival of a son who, he, who celebrated his birthday yesterday, Senator Rand Paul. <laughs> so I'm State Senator Jim Forsyth. I'm from the Lakes region right below you guys, right uh, down Laconia, Alton, Guilford. It's an honor to be hosting. I'm uh, Dr. Paul's campaign uh, chairman. Uh, New, in New Hampshire. We also have Senator S Sanborn on board and Senator White. So we're glad to have support of so many senators. Um, I really got the honor of uh, working with Rand Paul back in 2007 when he was campaigning for his dad. And I got to really know him well because we were driving around and he is a true believer. He is someone who at that time did not want to run. He didn't want to run for office. He had a successful practice. Uh, he was a family man. And um, but I think he saw the call to duty and he ran. And we're so happy that he did because he's done a fantastic job. And uh, Senator Rand Paul will introduce his father. Thank you. Thank you. What a crowd. What a crowd. Anybody here for Ron Paul already? All right. All, right. all, the, all of you here for Ron Paul, just be quiet. And I'll try to get to the undecided then. No, no, we'll take whatever cheers and approval we can get. Many years ago, uh, Reagan was uh, getting ready to go to a summit with Gorbachev. And he told his staff he was going to tell this story. And his uh, staff said, oh, no, if you do it, there'll be an international incident. And Reagan did anyway, went ahead and told this story. And it, it, said, it, it seems that there was an accountant in Moscow. And this accountant had wanted to buy a car. So he saved up his money for years and years because nobody had much money in the Soviet Union. There was only one car dealer. It was the state. It was a crummy piece of crap car, but it was a car nonetheless. So he saved for years and years, and he went into the state dealership, and he put his money down, and the surly bureaucrat said, well, that's all good and well. Come back in 10 years, and you can pick up your car. And the accountant didn't miss a beat. He said, well, will that be on a Tuesday or a Wednesday? <laughs> and the surly bureaucrat looked at him and said, I told you it'll be 10 years. Do you want to know if it'll be a Tuesday or Wednesday? He said, yeah, the plumber's coming on Wednesday, and I don't want to miss it. <laughs> now, when I first started telling that story, I thought, well, people in America won't get it because how could we ever conceive of the government owning our car dealerships and our car manufacturers? But you know the new, the new acronym or the new abbreviation for GM, right? Government Motors. <laughs> We've come a long way, but we've been going a long way really in the wrong direction. We've been going towards the government owning businesses, owning banks, bailing out people who made bad decisions. Anybody here think that a banker who makes $100 million a year on Wall Street or $10 million a year on Wall Street, if he makes a bad decision and he's going bankrupt, that we should bail him out so he gets a $10 million bonus the next year? Anybody believe that? No. I got started running as part of the Tea Party movement in 2010 because I was unhappy with Republicans. I was unhappy with Republicans who doubled the debt under George Bush, who doubled the size of the Department of Education, and then had the audacity to vote for this bank bailout. So that's why I got involved. People say, you can't run and say Republicans are doing a bad job and get elected as a Republican, but I guess you can because it makes a difference what kind of Republican we get. I tell people... The Republican Party is an empty vessel unless we imbue it with values. Now, you've got a lot of candidates running around New Hampshire saying they're Reagan conservatives. But Reagan would be rolling over in his grave to hear people say they're Reagan conservatives when they voted to double the size of the Department of Education, which half of them on the stage did, 
when they supported an individual mandate, the linchpin of Obamacare, when they supported foreign aid around the world, all of these things are inconsistent with the conservative wing of our party. There's only been one candidate who through the years has voted against the spending bills, against the appropriation bills, who has voted for a balanced budget, for a balanced budget amendment, who has opposed and never voted for any budget that wasn't balanced. Now some of them will say, oh, I'm, I never voted for pl Planned Parenthood. Everyone on the stage voted for all those budgets that always had money for Planned Parenthood. Now they put in a line saying, oh, the money won't go for abortion. They all voted for the budget anyway because they were a rubber stamp. They never had the courage to say no. But there has been somebody in Washington who's had the courage to vote no, who's been one of the few candidates who has voted no sometimes even by himself. There's only been one candidate in Washington who's never been accused of flip-flopping. There's only been one candidate in Washington who the lobbyists don't even bother to come to his office. <laughs> And there's only one candidate, and this is the uh, anomaly that bugs the heck out of people and they can't understand it. They can't understand this narrative because they want to paint Ron Paul as someone who doesn't believe in a strong national defense, and it's absolutely untrue. You know who the soldiers trust with their money and their contributions more than any other candidate? Ron Paul. <laughs> Good answer. There's only one candidate in the race who's gotten more contributions from active duty soldiers than all of the other candidates combined. And I think a soldier, a young man or woman who puts their life on the line, who sends a contribution, and a lot of them have been sending them to Ron Paul, shows that there are many soldiers who are thoughtful about going to war. That war isn't always the answer. They will fight for their country. They've volunteered to go to f and fight for their country. But they're thoughtful about it. They're very thoughtful about it, and they know that they're putting their life on the line, and they want to have a commander-in-chief who will have the same thoughtfulness, and I give you that new and hopefully commander-in-chief, my father, Ron Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pretty soon he's going to be able to get up on a stage and give a pretty good speech, don't you think? <laughs> well, we're going to have a little different format. I'm not going to start off with a long speech, but the format will be that uh, Jim will uh, ask me a few questions, and then we'll get some questions from the audience. Thank you, Dr. Paul. So you served in Congress for 12 terms, which is quite a long time, but you were practicing medicine you know, before that, and you continued to practice medicine since that. What was practicing medicine like in those days, and how have you seen it change, and how, what, how's that influenced how you feel about government uh, approach to medicine? Well, th that's one thing that I have witnessed, the change in, in the medical practice. I uh, went to uh, school, uh, college in the 50s, and started medical school in 57, and graduated uh, in 19, uh, end of 1960. But uh, finished a couple years of residency and then did some practice before government was very much involved in medicine. That was before Medicaid, before Medicare, and, uh, and there was just minimal government. The government, you know, took care of veterans and some others. But then in the uh, 60s, um, LBJ, I don't know if you remember him or not, but uh, he, he claimed that we could have guns and butter. Of course, they were fighting the Vietnam War. But at the same time, the butter was that he had to make sure that everybody was taken care of. So he introduced this idea that the federal government had to take over medical care. And subsequently, over these last uh, decades, uh, he has done that. But we have seen a dramatic change. The most important uh, negative is that the cost of medicine has skyrocketed. The second negative, it has destroyed 
virtually the doctor-patient relationship. And third, it's introduced not socialized medicine, but corporate medicine. Uh, we don't have government really running things and owning it. That would be very, very bad. But corporate medicine isn't a whole lot better. So we have corporations. Drug companies become powerful lobbyists. The insurance companies are powerful lobbyists. And the medical profession are powerful lobbyists. And the management company. So it's a dramatic change. But the little bit of experience I had in the early uh, in the early 60s was in a um, in a Catholic hospital and all I remember is I didn't get paid very much <laughs> because I was uh, you know I was coming to an emergency room and wanted to make a couple dollars I was moonlighting I was in the military and but the one thing I noticed is everybody got taken care of and people who could pay they paid nobody was turned away but people People, you know, received received medical care. It wasn't like a period of time, whether it was in the 50s and early 60s, that I recall that people were lying out in the streets and not getting medical care. It was just delivered differently now. But now we have introduced a changed medical system where, you know, the quality goes down, the cost goes up, and everybody is unhappy. The patients grow unhappy, and, they're, and it's going to get so much worse with Obamacare. So... I think a good way to start once uh, we sort of take over things in Washington will be to get rid of Obamacare and make sure the, per the control of medicine is returned to you, the citizen, the patient. And, and Doc... Maybe we can stay up. Good suggestion. <laughs> Okay, and so, you so your uh, budget plans to cut a trillion dollars in the first year and balance the budget in three. It uh, stands in stark contrast to a lot of the other candidates. Why do you feel that cutting uh, spending is important? A lot of people say that we need to spend more in order to stimulate the economy. Well, actually, the country doesn't spend less. The government spends less. When you cut the federal budget, the people get to spend more. And when the people spend the money, they spend it uh, with um, a much better, uh, much, uh, m much more wisdom than when the government spends it. The government, actually, we lose twice. If they take a trillion dollars out of our pockets, uh, you lose a trillion dollars. If the government spends a trillion dollars, they usually spend it getting itself into trouble, whether it's overseas spending, that's a waste, or if they spend it on bureaucrats, that's a waste, that's putting more pressure on us, uh, and, uh, and then we have to have additional expenses for uh, overcoming the bureaucracy. So I think we, uh, we, really, get, we really lose twice that way. But uh, we, we need to cut a trillion dollars uh, if we're serious. The proposed cuts so far aren't really cuts. They're cuts on proposed increases. They have what they call baseline budgeting. The uh, budget goes up automatically at a, at a certain rate. And if you cut a trillion dollars over, over 10 years, that's $100 billion per year that they're going to cut on the proposed increases. But today, let's just compare $100 billion a year cut on the proposed increases versus what's happening today, the budget's going up $100 billion of real costs every month. So that is a fantasy. It has nothing to do with cuts. And nobody's talking about it. Right now, they're nearly hysterical about these, some of these mandated cuts uh, uh, because of the uh, super committee. They're talking about cuts in, and, and Obama mentioned they were going to cut something out of, the, out of the military. There are no cuts proposed, whether they're Democrats or Republicans. They're only cuts on these wild proposed increases. They're not willing to admit that this country can't continue to run up a deficit of $1.5 trillion a year. It's growing exponentially, and if we're serious, we have to get, them, get the federal government out of our wallets and out of our lives, and we have to let the people spend the money. Then we have a much better chance of regaining prosperity. Now Dr. Paul, you know, I served in the Air Force and I, I flew um, KC 135s for Bosnia and um, doing the no fly zone uh, for Iraq between the Gulf Wars. So I'm somebody who saw firsthand that there's a big difference between defense and military, overseas military spending. A lot of the things we were involved in weren't defending our country. Can you talk about of your, I think it's 500 billion of your trillion gets cut um, 
Is that military spending, defense spending, and what would defense look like under a Paul presidency? Yeah, I think this is a very important point because as soon as you talk about cutting uh, funds overseas and that it's cutting it from, say, the DOD, uh, and they, oh, the defense spending, you want to slash defense spending, but really not. There's a big difference between military spending, overseas spending, foreign aid spending, department, state of department spending, and all the activities, whether it's CIA activities, now the CIA. You can't distinguish the CIA from the military anymore. The CIA controls drone bombings any place in the world from um, Langley, from Washington, D.C. I mean, it's absolutely out of control. But the military spending is what you want to cut. And you actually can have a better defense from this because we're just looking for trouble when we have this military spending, occupying countries, telling other people what to do and how they have to run their country and threatening everybody and no, no spot, they admit it, there's no spot on the earth that is safe because we can hit any single spot and any particular individual. So there's a big difference between, between the two. Uh, so when, when they say that, oh, he wants to slash defense spending, it's not true. I want to slash the military-industrial complex because they're making too much profits doing the wrong thing. <laughs> and, and, and then just recently the uh, jobs numbers came out and there was some good news for the jobs numbers. Are we out of the woods? Has, has the economy started to recover and we're all in good shape? Well, that's wished we were, but uh, no, I don't think we are. I think we're in the midst of a financial crisis and a correction that is the biggest in anybody's lifetime in this room. And uh, unless somebody lived through the total depression through the 30s, that was pretty bad. But we're on the verge of this being much worse. Because the uh, financial bubble is understandable if you understand monetary policy in the Federal Reserve. The bubbles come, the depression, recessions come inevitably. And this bubble... The major bubble has been forming since uh, August 15, 1971, when we severed the last link to gold, which meant that governments could spend endlessly, borrow, and print money. And the size of government just grew exponentially. At the same time, the deficit did because we could rely on the printing of the money, and the world would be willing to uh, take the dollar. So we have inflated. We had our best export, which are dollars. So we buy goods from overseas at a cheap rate. Now we're indebted to the world. We owe $3 trillion to overseas. At the same time, jobs are really gone. The 200,000 jobs is nothing compared to what's really going on. This, this is a notion that 8.5% of the people are unemployed. It's fictitious because even if you look at the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, they will admit that if you count the people that are partially employed, it's like 17, 18 percent. And if you conclude everybody, the people who have dropped out of the workforce or the people who are working two days part time, unemployment's over 20 percent. And that's why the people feel a lot worse than the government wants us to feel by propping up these statistics. They also tell us, you know, that there's no inflation. Prices are going up at 2 percent. All you have to do is be on a fixed income or receiving Social Security. Your standard of living is going down because the dollar is shrinking uh, in value. So there's nothing, I mean, everybody's glad to see some activity, but this is very temporary. This problem is a worldwide, uh, as even like the problem with China that we have right now. We exported a lot of dollars to China. We got a lot of goods in, but China inflated their currency too, so they have a bubble. So when this comes down, Europe is collapsing right now, and yet all Bernanke can do, and all our, uh, our, our Secretary of the Treasury can do, Geithner, all they can do is go over and we'll bail you out, we'll take care of it. The American people won't figure it out until it's over, but we can bail you out with just printing dollars, and we're going to buy up the bad debt. They did that, you know, after the collapse in 2008. Yes. There, there were a lot of problems, but the people who had ripped this off and made all that money, they should have gone bankrupt and not you getting stuck with the bill. So we're prepared right now, unfortunately, to bail uh, all of Europe because our banks are connected to the European banks. The European banks bought all the debt 
of these, these countries like Greece and Italy and Spain, and that debt isn't worth anything. Just like we bought up the worthless debt in this country, the mortgage debt, they said, they said it was illiquid. Uh, nobody would buy it. Well, it was illiquid because it wasn't worth anything, but the Fed bought it and the Treasury bought it, and that is major. So I wish that we had turned around, but you cannot turn an economy around until you eradicate this debt overhang because right now we're like an individual who has borrowed too much money. They still have a job, but all their income is, is being used to pay the interest on the debt and they can't get ahead, and they keep borrowing for time. They kept getting more credit cards and credit cards. So we're at that stage now where the debt is automatically going up and the spending is automatically going up and they're not proposing cuts. Eventually what has to happen is that we have to wipe that debt off the books so we can get back to work again. And right now they're doing everything in the world. They're in total denial in Washington that what we have to do because it's uh, uncomfortable or they don't understand it, but they don't want to cut anything. So uh, this is why I think we're in very serious trouble. But there are answers. Sound economic policy and free markets and, and, and you know, property rights and the, the things that made America great and wealthy. That's what we need. But we cannot do it by just papering it over and printing money. Thank you. So we're going to open it up now to questions from the audience. What I would really, really appreciate, we're two days away from the primary. Dr. Paul is surging above 20% now. So it's abs it's absolutely critical that we get every vote possible. So I ask you, if you're a Ron Paul supporter, uh, if you're from out of town, please leave it to the undecided voters who are from New Hampshire to ask questions, please. Okay. And uh, there should be some people going around to the audience with microphones to answer questions, ask questions. One of the most devastating diagnoses a family or a senior can get is that of Alzheimer's and dementia. What would you do to help stop this terrible disease, which is affecting more and more and costing our country billions in productivity every year? Well, I think what we have to do for all devastating diseases, if uh, you know somebody that's uh, suffering from Alzheimer's, it's devastating. But all diseases are devastating. What you want is a system that is the most efficient way of taking care of problems like that, which means that you have to really challenge depending on the government to do it. Because the, ch the government gets involved and uh, if you take the research and development of government, most of those funds are divvied up for political reasons. Drug companies are very, very powerful. So even though some good can come from that, it's really not the answer. It's, it's, the, it's the, the, the change in the medical system that we have now that we get totally dependent on the government. Now, in my proposal for these significant cuts, it doesn't deal with, uh, you know, I have priorities that I try to protect because we have become so dependent on some of these, whether it's Social Security or medical care and some medical research and child health care. I'm trying to get a system where we can work things out and take care of people like that. But if we continue to do what we're doing, whether you're sick or not sick, you're not going to get anything. And Social Security it will collapse if we collapse our currency. So whether it's Alzheimer or cancer or whatever, uh, the most efficient way to solve those problems is not through dependency on government because all those funds are, are allotted for political reasons and uh, they're not necessarily the most efficient. To assume if the government doesn't do it, it won't happen is, is a false assumption because if the government's out of our way and we became prosperous again instead of a shrinking middle class, there will be more funds. Even in spite of all this, there are some very wealthy people in this country who do put a lot of money into research. There would be hundreds, if not thousands, of more people who would have these funds available. If we would have stuck with this, you know, uh, hospitals that were run by churches and others, uh, we wouldn't be facing, facing this crisis. Even, even in the midst of all this, these problems that we have, uh, even today in Galveston, Texas, we have a hospital that takes care of burn patients and uh, it's, it's children. 
and, and they're not charged. So the confidence has to be placed. Can these problems, these difficult problems, be solved only by government? Or would they be much better if you had a free and prosperous economy and uh, work many of these problems out as we did before 1965? Congressman, our question is, with abolishing five departments, how would you replace them, especially the, the de Department of Education? How? Do I? Okay. Oh, okay. She talked about the five departments that I want to get rid, uh, rid of. How, what would we do to replace those responsibilities that these five departments have? Well, for the most part, I wouldn't want to replace them because I, I don't... I don't think we need a Department of Education. <laughs> what I want to do is, uh, is go back to the assumption that it's not the federal government's proper authority or ability to tell your parents how to educate you. That should be the parents' responsibility. And this would mean... This would mean that uh, if, if people become unsatisfied with the educational system, what we have to do is protect your right to be homeschooled or, or schooled in, in private school or whatever. But once again, when the government gets involved and they pump money into any area, whether it's medicine or education or housing, it doesn't increase pro, pro, uh, it, equality. Uh, it, what it does increase is the price. The prices go up. But the, pro the quality and the extent of those services don't, don't go up. So getting rid of those departments mean, doesn't mean that we want to give up on them, but we want them to be delivered in a different fashion. We, we aren't convinced that the government is very good at delivering these, uh, these, uh, these, these goods and services. So this would, uh, this would mean that you don't, uh, if you cut... If, if people get worried and say, oh, a lot of federal officials are going to be laid off from work, eventually under my plan that would happen, but they don't get laid off immediately. We want assimilation and gradually reduce the workforce in the federal government. But they're not doing productive work. We want people to work in the free market economy and do productive work. So it's a matter of how you deliver goods and services. There's no evidence whatsoever that government is very good at doing that job. Uh, there's been much talk about lowering the uh, corporate tax, and yet we have a, a company like uh, General Electric that presently has 60% uh, of their products made overseas. And my question is, how is lowering the corporate tax, given the fact that they don't even pay a corporate tax on their current structure uh, due to the loopholes, they don't pay anything. So how does lowering the corporate t tax bring jobs back to America? Well, the one thing is, is if uh, you are a corporation, you're international, and you make money, and they have that money overseas, they probably pay taxes overseas at a lesser rate, and that's why they're overseas. But we penalize them if we want them to come here and build a plant home, at home, they will have an additional tax, so they'll be, able to be taxed twice. And we're one of, I think, two countries that actually does that. And, you know, tax is the return of capital. You have to have capital to start businesses. Capital can't come out of a printing press. And, and Keynesian liberals believe that you can get capital, uh, which should come from savings, uh, out of the Federal Reserve printing money, and, and it doesn't work. So you want low taxes, but you want low taxes for everybody. I mean, if, if, if the people had low taxes, if we didn't have an income tax, that means everybody would have more money to spend. So, but we in, we in many ways chase businesses overseas. We, we do it. The currency manipulation and, and uh, the, the fact that we have this reserve currency is a detriment to us, even though in the short run it looks like a good deal because we export money and get goods. So you can't do it with the monetary system. You can't do it with this excessive regulatory system. And the tax code and the tax system chases countries away, uh, uh, companies away. Businesses can be started uh, in China and other countries within three weeks of trying to start a business. Here it will take three years uh, to get a business started. That is not a healthy climate, and they will go overseas. Now, as far as some of the rich 
who don't pay taxes and they have benefits, I distinguish them uh, and I put them into two categories. Some are very rich and they have a lot of money and they manipulated the system, the inflationary system, the contract system, they make money off you by getting contracts from the government, they're in the military industrial complex and they're very much involved. That to me is not legitimate profits. If a company is big because it delivers a profit at a good price and you and I you know, reward them by buying their product and they get rich, we don't want to punish them because that's earned capital. We should encourage them to stay so we don't want to overtax them. But take these companies that made a lot of money in the derivatives market, all the speculations, then they went bankrupt and then they went to the government and they got bailed out and most of the salaries were protected and they're still back making money. That's the kind of rich people we should deal with, the ones who are ripping us off, but not people who provide good services for us. Congressman? Where? Here. here we go, back here. You mentioned unemployment rate being 8.5, 15, 20. There are many of us believe that it's short by about 468. That's 435 members of the House of Representatives, and it's 33 senators. If we were to hand you a clean slate, if we were to hand the next president a clean slate with a brand new Congress with 435 new faces and 33 new senators, what could you do with it to put America back to work again? That means I have all the votes and uh, we're ready to go. Split well, 50-50. Pardon me? 50-50, Democrat, Republican, the Auburn goes yeah, to the okay. independents. Now, what you can, can do is a president has the most responsibility in foreign policy. You can change the attitude of the world by being commander-in-chief and saying, we're done with the wasteful, unwinnable, undeclared wars and start bringing the troops home and have them spend their money here at home. You have to have a revision of the monetary system. Uh, to do it completely, you would have to have the cooperation of the Congress. Even that takes a little bit of time. But the immediate thing we should do is to find out what's going on. That means a thorough, complete audit of the Federal Reserve and who they've been taking care of for all these decades. And then, then in order to get that transi transition started, you have to legalize competition with, with the Federal Reserve. Today, it's a monopoly. You go to jail for using gold coins and silver coins. So you want competition with the Federal Reserve. So if you get nervous about the paper money losing value, you can deal in gold and silver. And that would require some legislation that I've introduced for years. We would be able to get, get that passed. But you have to cut the spending. And that is the most important thing. Cutting the spending and stop the bailouts. Let the bad debt be liquidated. Don't let the American people get stuck with buying up this bad debt. When that message is set, sent, that we will have a different tax code, reduced taxation, respect for contract rights and, and, and a sound money, and a change foreign policy. I think psychologically things would change immediately because it is confidence of, with the direction we're going. The people won't go back to businessmen, won't be you know, investing until they get their confidence back. And as long as you just, every time we have a problem, they go to Washington to pass another program and put another layer of regulations on. And of course, it's, it's uh, Dodd-Frank. That's hanging out there <clears throat> as, as well as Obamacare. That's just a burden. It's a weight. And you've got to get that off. And I believe we could do that. How you doing? Thank you, Dr. Paul. Um, I have two jobs. My first job is that I uh, teach American and constitutional history at a community college. So I want to say thank you for talking so much about the Constitution. Uh, it's very much appreciated by myself and I'm sure everybody else in the room. Thank you. My second job is I work for the New York City Police Department. I was a first responder along with thousands of other colleagues on September 11th into the city. I think that... I think that a lot of people that like what you say about the Constitution and about domestic policy are, are a little bit on the fence in terms of what you're saying about foreign policy and especially September 11th. I was wondering if you okay. could uh, talk a little bit more to maybe reassure people that are on the fence. Well, 
I think, you know, 9-11 will be remembered by every one of us. One of the significant events of 9-11, it brought American people together. We weren't Republicans or Democrats. It was a devastating day. And it should have been a time when we reassessed all our values, our foreign policy, and, and everything else. But instead of the result being that uh, we uh, put the burden on the American people and pass a Patriot Act and undermine the privacies of all the people, isn't the proper answer for 9-11. For but uh, it was shortly thereafter that uh, we had a vote, you know, to give the president the authority to go after those individuals responsible for it. And that, of course, I strongly supported. Uh, but I did not... I, I did not believe for a minute that authority should have been used the way it was used because it, it went to, it, it, that authority was used to go to war against Iraq. You know, oh yeah, the Iraqis were involved and Al-Qaeda was there, and that wasn't true. So it was used to do things. The Patriot Act had been floating around. It was an excuse to pass the Patriot Act. It was used as an excuse to go to war against Iraq. So it, we, we have to sort that out. We can't just, you know, fly off uh, and, and do things that are more harmful. But we have to do the things to defend this country. But, uh, you know, if you get involved in uh, more than 130 countries and 900 bases, we're not doing ourselves much of a favor because we don't have any money. But uh, I think it's, it's, it's very important that we understand it. The one thing that was in, important about the evaluation of 9-11 of uh, was that uh, one thing Paul Wolfowitz, who was the, uh, you know, the big uh, orchestrator for the war going into Iraq, uh, as, soon as, uh, as soon as that happened, within days, he said, you know what? He says, uh, this will give us a chance to get our troops out of Saudi Arabia because bin Laden was using that as a recruiting tool. So you have to give that some thought. Our troops in Saudi Arabia was seen to be on holy land, was used as a recruiting tool by bin Laden to do us harm. So they took the troops out of Saudi Arabia. But what they don't understand is troops in Muslim countries around the world, and in the Middle East in particular, is still inciting people. And when we go into Pakistan with no authority whatsoever, lob these bombs after one or two or three people that are some of the bad people and then have innocent people killed, the best way to look at that is, well, how would we react if somebody did that to us? So I'm, the, the challenge I get is that I don't want to be engaged around the world. Matter of fact, I want to be very much engaged, but in a different manner. I don't want to be engaged by acting like a bully, and if they do what we say, we, we bribe them and give them more money. If they don't, we start a war with them and we occupy their countries. I'm sick and tired of that. What we need to do is influence the world with our goodness. Our goodness will be spread if we do a good job, if we have freedom and prosperity and civil rights here in this country, and we mind our own business and we don't go around bullying people, maybe people would want to see us as an example and maybe they would want to emulate us. This is so much different than what we're, what we're doing today and that's how my approach That's how my approach would be. Um, until two weeks ago, I was an undecided Republican voter. I'm no longer undecided. Wait, only an undecided question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, at, the, uh, at the prompting of my 16-year-old son, I took a good look at the Ron Paul campaign, and I'm liking what I'm seeing. My question is, what advice would you give to a young man exploring a possible career in public service? Thank you. B very important question because, you know, uh, uh, we have a large family, a lot of grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and uh, we talk about those kind of things. But you have to define public service. You know, if, uh, if you want to uh, be become a bureaucrat someplace, engage in a department that isn't authorized by the Constitution, I probably wouldn't all be all that encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I still take my responsibility uh, very seriously as a congressman about appointing people who are very serious about studying and training in our military academies. And uh, I think that's very important. Uh, 
And, and we always need that. But also we need an education. Now, Jim talked a little bit about that. And he also got his education after he was sent over and found out what he was actually doing in the military. And it was different. So, no, you have to be careful about it. Just to say anything in government is public service and therefore it's okay. I think of public service as maybe being a local policeman, you know, dealing with it and providing safety and security for us here at home uh, rather than accepting any role in the federal government. All you have to do is look at the Constitution. If it's not in Article 1, Section 8, you better question whether we should be doing it. We should. <laughs> yes, Congressman, what will be your policy on uh, the state of Israel? What would the policy be with the state of Israel? I would want to maintain very close relations with Israel. I want to be a good friend of Israel. And I also want to respect them in, in many ways that I do not think the United States should undermine their sovereignty in any way. The establishment of Israel came about with a movement called uh, Zionism, and Zionism had two basic principles. One was independence and self-reliance, and I agree with those two basic uh, uh, fundamental premises of Zionism. But. I also don't think we should tell them what to do. If they want to have a peace treaty with some neighbor and think they can work it out, they shouldn't have to ask us for permission. They shouldn't have to ask us permission to defend their borders. That should be their business. But also, I do not believe that I should take money from anybody here and send money to Israel. Now, some people would say, Oh, that means you're anti-Israel. But I'm pro-American. <laughs> but, but no, actually, this is a benefit to Israel. First, when you give money, that implies we own you. And second is if you cut out all foreign aid, Israel comes out ahead. Because their neighbors get about five times as much uh, assistance, you know, than Israel gets. So uh, I don't think... I don't think it's much of a problem, but we should be friends. We should trade with them. Uh, I would encourage them to become the Hong Kong of the Middle East or something like that. You know, have a really uh, affluent society. But we have, uh, we, uh, we have every reason to want to get along, and, and we can. Uh, but uh, to, to control them and regulate and, and hold them back, I think that is not necessary. Matter of fact, Netanyahu was before the Congress, you know, this year. And he was explicit. You can go and look at his speech. He says, we do not need American troops to defend our country. He says, we don't, what, we don't need American troops. He said, Israel can take care of itself. And I think we should respect that. <laughs> Oh, I thought I got to hold it. Uh, Dr. Paul, a uh, question. My, my daughter has been ill for many years, and now she's on our insurance, but she'll graduate from college. Does she have to stand in line at a, at a charity hospital to get help under your administration? Well, you'll probably be standing in line of, uh, under Obamacare, let me tell you. At the rate we're going, it's going to be, be difficult. It's been messed up, and that's why I have reserved the final decision on the reform of the medical care for elderly and the children and also Social Security because it's messed up. Because it's messed up, you can't say those of us who want to reform it and get it back to sound footing is at fault because, you know, the money has been spent. The money isn't there for Social Security. Medicaid and Medicare has really no money in, in the bank. So I want to preserve at least what people have become uh, de dependent on. Um, but the, the whole thing is, is uh, uh, the insurance business and the way, the way we have given uh, benefits, to, uh, tax benefits to insurance over the years has encouraged problems with transferring a policy. But to, under a, a good insurance system, a free market system, if a child or an 18-year-old or whatever buys an insurance policy and pays for it, 
and, and it doesn't go with the job, you don't have to transfer it. The contract should be there. They should never be able to cancel you. But, to, but then we got into this mess where it goes with the company but not with the individual. If you have individual insurance, you don't get the deduction. If you work for a big company, you do. You transfer your job. Then you have to have a new insurance company. That's all artificial. The market has been messed up that way. So because that is more complex, I'd want to work to that system. But in the meantime, the only way we can save the medical care system from total bankruptcy and really ruining the care completely is by cutting spending elsewhere. That's why I think we should all come together with looking at this overseas spending that has nothing to do with our national defense. Okay. All right, we have time for uh, one more question. Dr. Paul, I'm over here. <laughs> I'm an independent voter and um, cherish that. And I'm feeling very hopeless about any president succeeding right now because of the way Congress doesn't work together because essentially it's a two-party system and they're fighting. So someone asked you earlier, what would you do if you could start fresh? The reality is you can't, right? Can't what? You can't start fresh with Congress and... Okay, well, uh, maybe, maybe I can give you a better answer if I didn't understand the other one. Okay, um, but go ahead, finish so up. With the Congress that you have and will have, depending on what people vote, how are you going... How would you handle the competition between the, and the fighting between the two sides? With difficulty. <laughs> But with a new approach, completely new. Everybody knows what I'm talking about is different. Because I have such a strange new idea. It's obeying the Constitution. <laughs> but, but I know exactly what you're talking about. And I appeal to that group. Independent people who are sick and tired of the two-party system. The people who are going out on... Uh, on Occupy Wall Street. They're sick and tired of it. Tea Party people are sick and tired of it because it's, it's not working because they have accepted failed economic policies. So you can't change it without changing policy. You, have to, you can't tinker on the edges about foreign policy and say, well, we're going to cut this and here. We'll only go into two countries instead of three. You have to decide whether we're the policemen of the world. And that's what has to be decided. Now, our fallacy over these many decades, when it was endless spending and we didn't have to be responsible, we kept re-electing the members of Congress so the people have some responsibility too. They kept spending the money and they kept bringing the goods back to their districts, saying, look what I did, look what I did. But how did they do it? They had, they had too much compromise. There were conservatives who spent money endlessly for their project, liberals spent them for the other, there was no money, so they agreed to raise the national debt. So that was the wrong kind of compromise. I don't look at as what we need is more compromise. What we need is more coalition building. And this is why I think freedom works and the Constitution works, because it brings people together for different reasons. People who understand freedom want to use their freedom the way they want in their personal lives, and other people want to use their freedom in their economic lives and spend their money as they see fit. So this would bring people together if they understand this. But... The coalition's about uh, spending overseas. I work with a lot of independent type moderate liberal Democrats who see this more likely than some conservative Republicans. So I think you have to work with those people, protecting civil liberties, prote you know, cut cutting some of this overseas spending. At the same time, you have to work with people who you know, have, uh, have some better sense on uh, too, much, too much spending here at home. But if, uh, if we continue to depend on deficit spending, there is, there is no solution. The big difference will be with the victory in this race for our campaign sends a very powerful message. And it's also the reason they are very, very scared because they, the term that they use that I always give a chuckle about is they say, we have to stop Ron Paul. He's dangerous. <laughs> that means if you're supporting me, you're a very dangerous person because you want balanced budget, living within our means, sound money, uh, follow the Constitution, defending America. And, but I believe, 
I really believe sincerely we can bring the people together, not necessarily with the crowd up there right now, but if the, a new president has those views, a lot of new people will be swept in. But there's one other secret weapon we have that can help change things. I'll let you in on a secret. The people in Washington aren't all that principled. Did you know that? <laughs> so you have to use that to our advantage because that doesn't mean you have to get rid of everybody. All you have to do is let your voice be heard and say, you help out, you vote a certain way, vote against Obamacare or whatever it is, or we're going to send you home. So you can pressure them to come along with the programs I'm suggesting. Thank you very much. That was it. Distinguished uh, the oh, yeah. difference between objectivism and uh, libertarianism. Yes. Okay, that's important. Uh, yeah. I assume that's why you're not a libertarian. Pardon me? I assume that's why you're not a libertarian. Well, uh, I don't shy away from that. She probably knew Murray Rothbard. Yeah, yeah. My mom grew up with objectivism, and I grew up with it as a result of this moment. And um, my house has six copies of that. <laughs> Do you have one of the first copies? I have one of the first 57, one of the first commandments. I don't, but I have a lot of the art. <laughs> Okay, Thank good. you so much. Thank you. Congress, oh, okay. the college. So you're not registered. No. Okay. Uh, Ronnie. <laughs> so much. So you say you're not registered. Ronnie, for me. Sure, he'll do that. Thanks. It's Jared. Jared Fisk. Okay, I'll give him that. Thanks for. Servant okay. mentioned that last night about being drafted. So was I. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Back in the 60s? Yeah, Vietnam, yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. But well, I didn't have any wife. I was single. <laughs> but you know what? I think, you, I think you could get out easier if you had kids. Yeah. But a doctor, they had, yeah, no, they, they, had, took, they, they, they didn't give us exceptions. No, no. They were tougher on us. I got wounded on the side of the doctors I, around. <laughs> I'm from Texas. Oh, wow. Can I get a photo with you? Can we get a photo with you? How can anybody do anything with this? <laughs> <laughs> Here you go, Thank you so much. All right. Hey, John, right here. Right. 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 Turned off. You turned off. Real quick. Real quick. Real quick. Okay, good to see you,
cameras are rolling here at Meredith, New Hampshire, as Ron Paul finishes up his town hall meeting. This is his last campaign stop for him today. He's going to be moving on uh, from here, and when he does so, he will be done for the day. Uh, he, as you know, was part of this uh, morning's NBC News debate and last night's ABC News debate. So a long day for the candidates, including the congressman from Texas. And we're going to be taking your phone calls here for the next 10, 15 minutes or so. Get your thoughts on what you just heard from Ron Paul. Let me give you the phone numbers. If you are a Democrat, 202-737-0001, and Republicans, 202-737-0002. And uh, let's see here. In New Hampshire voters, 202-628-0205. We're at Church Landing at Mill Falls here in Meredith, New Hampshire. And I have a New Hampshire resident here with me. Michelle, you're from Manchester. You drove about an hour yes. to hear from Ron Paul. Why? Well, time is running out, and I take my... Uh, my voting very seriously, and um, I'm starting to really, uh, re it's resonating with me what Ron Paul is saying, and I figured if I'm leaning that way, I really want to see him before I make that final decision. Why are you undecided, though? I mean, you're leaning that way. What other what other candidates appeal to you? Well, I just feel like it's such an important time in history, and um, as a mother of a seven-year-old, I feel like this decision is, is just so important for the direction of the future. And um, I, I just want to make sure that government doesn't get out of control, but at the same time, someone who is going to be able to get things done in Congress. Who are some of the other candidates that you that you'd like? I like Huntsman, um, and uh, Romney's okay. But I, I honestly like what Ron Paul has to say most of all. My biggest concern is really, can he get it done? Why do you like Huntsman? Huntsman seems to just uh, he has that negotiating. He seems to be able to earn the respect of both sides. I think negotiating skills are going to be crucial in getting anything done. Um, I think that his his whole uh, platform on trust is so true and relevant today. Um, so I really like Huntsman too. So um, I've got a few more hours. <laughs> Did you watch last night's debate? Did you watch this morning's debate? What'd you think? I watched last night's and I watched this morning's. I was much more impressed with this morning's. Uh, the questions that were asked to me were far more pertinent and relevant and helped me with my decision making process. Last night's questions were a little odd, um, but that too, that also uh, gave me that that extra boost to make the drive over to Meredith, to drive an hour to see Ron Paul. Have you seen other candidates? Not in person, not in person, but um, certainly been following it awfully closely. Living in New Hampshire, you just have to. When do you think you'll decide? I will decide on Tuesday when the curtain falls behind me. When you go into the polling place, then you will make your decision. Absolutely. Not until then. It's my right as a New Hampshire resident. All right. So what, for between now and then, are you going to be listening to the local news and following these candidates? What will you be doing to help you try to make that decision? Again, my biggest concern with Ron Paul is because I'm just not confident that he's going to be able to persuade the Congress uh, to be able to do all of these awesome things. So I want to do a little more research to find out what his record is. And have you always voted Republican, Michelle? No, I'm an independent. So it's it's whoever I feel is most uh, relevant for the time. What do you do for a living? I'm a teacher. How did you vote last time around, four years ago? I actually voted for McCain, so I did vote Republican. Uh, but I tend to be a moderate, Repo moderate, I guess, middle of the middle of the road person. So uh, that balance, healthy balance, is important to me. Well, what about McCain's endorsement of Mitt Romney? Yeah, I was surprised by that. I I was very surprised because I felt like uh, when he was running against Romney, there were so many uh, just core values that weren't in line with one another. I was just very surprised that he did endorse uh, Romney over Huntsman because Huntsman had worked for, for McCain in, in the past in getting his campaign going. So I, I was a little bit taken back by that. Michelle, thank you for talking to us today and for making the drive. And good luck with your decision. I know. Thank you. <laughs> we do want to take your phone calls, too. And let me just uh, go to the first phone call. Caller, if you could just tell me your name and where you're calling from. All the talking. And uh, we'll try to hear from some more people here in this room as well. Hello. I'm calling from Chicago. Uh, and uh, Ron Paul belongs on Mount Rushmore. Uh, soon 
hopefully later. Hasn't our hundred-year-old civil world war on drugs cost us many tens of trillions of dollars in the jailing of 40 million American foreigners forcing them, and foreigners forcing them into a lifetime of joblessness, welfare, and Medicaid for dependents to at $300,000 each, and in taxes lost to a $350 billion a year underground economy empowering gangsters, and in monopolizing a half trillion dollar a year pharmaceutical market by persecuting competition from free homegrown herbal medicine, and in losing ground in a dozen wars since Vietnam by double-crossing our very... Okay, let me jump in at that point, caller, and I've got another New Hampshire resident here with me. Yes. Sir, what's your name and who do you plan to vote for? My name is Richard Kincaid. I'm from Hopkinton, New Hampshire, and at this point I'm going to vote for um, Ron Paul. Where is, it? say the, the town again, where is that? Hopkinton, which is just outside of Concord. Okay, so you drove how long then to get here and to hear from Ron Paul? Oh yeah, we went an hour to get here. Uh, I think it's worth it to see all these people as much as we can. Uh, I was a, uh, I'm an independent voter. Uh, I voted for Obama last time. Big mistake in my mind. I can see okay. Ron Paul's side of the story and I like what he says. Well, he ran last time. Why didn't you vote for him last time then? Wasn't anybody else to vote for. <laughs> uh, oh, you mean uh, as far as Paul is concerned? Well, yeah, why didn't you vote for Ron Paul last time? Uh, I'm talking about the general election. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So you voted because it, because the matchup was Obama versus McCain. Right. Well, in the primary last time, did you vote for Ron Paul? Yes. Okay. So what is it about Ron Paul that you like? I like his stance on foreign policy. I was a military person for 10, 11 years. Uh, I flew 135s, as this gentleman just said. And um, I, uh, I don't believe that it's our job to go and invade other countries. And I got very upset with uh, the Bush administration over that whole thing. So you've seen the you've seen the other candidates. Is that what you've said? How many have you seen? This time, just a couple. Just a couple. Have they come to your area, or are you driving to go see them yourself? We drive and just take a look. But why, why do you make the drive? Well, depends on where they are. I look up every morning and see what they where they are. You do. You take your this primary process seriously. Oh, yes. I think everybody in New Hampshire does. One of my favorite stories is we spend our winters in Arizona. I went to the grocery store one time on the Arizona primary day and asked the lady, did you vote? And she said, why would I vote? What, what, what do you mean vote? And they just don't understand it the way we do here in New Hampshire. All right, sir. I got I to gotta wrap it up there because Ron Paul is coming back out. He's going to be doing a quick media avail, so we will end it there. Our camera we will keep rolling. Brooks, you got Thank you. Brooke. You guys take the picture. I'm about to take one. Okay, folks. We're going to get on it. We're going to get up. We're going to get the rest of it. Thank you very much. Best of luck in the election. I'm a Democrat. I hope we keep the you and Obama, and I will vote for you. Thank you. And I mean it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let's just jump through here. Nice to meet you. My hero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jesse, one more second. What's up, sir? John. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I need another microphone. Jen got sick of it. For years, he has to let go.
This is not going to work too well and not too long. Have the last people sit down, please. Everybody, thank you very much for sticking around and thanks for your patience as we work through just a couple difficult logistics. Uh, Dr. Paul is going to stick around and take three or four questions. We thank you very much. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, Anthony with NBC. Hi, Dr. Paul. You were able to get the majority of independent votes in Iowa. How do you plan to do that here in New Hampshire against Mitt Romney? By delivering the same message, because independents are independents, but I think the people here in, North, in New Hampshire are very independent-minded, and I have a strong appeal because I have uh, challenged both uh, the Republican and Democratic Party leadership, and that means they want a message of cleaning house, and that means changing policy, whether it's changing foreign policy, looking at the Federal Reserve, or doing something about these huge deficits that we have. So I feel very good about getting the independent vote here in New Hampshire. Sarah with the monitor. You got a question? Um, sure. Actually, it's one that has been asked of me of a few different voters. They've been saying that they're a little worried about your health. How are you holding up? She's, uh, she, she's asking about your health, sir. My health? Let's do a bicycle ride. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I feel, I feel very good, and uh, uh, your, your health depends on your mental status as well, too. So there, there's, uh, you, you know, nominal ages and then the, your mental health, but I feel excellent. The only thing frustrating about the campaigning is I don't get quite as much exercise as I get when I'm not campaigning so uh, energetically. So, no, I feel great. Yeah. Uh, Rodney, CBS. Hi, Dr. Paul. Today at the debate, you were attacked by all, pretty much all the candidates. How do you feel about those attacks, and do you feel that they were worthy? Yeah, asking about he was asking about the attacks uh, at the, um, at the uh, debates. Well, I think it was uh, understandable. Sometimes the, the more vicious they are, the easier it is to dismiss them. And I, I think I just mentioned a short while ago that uh, one of the ones that are supposed to tear me apart is that I'm a dangerous person. And uh, I admit it. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very dangerous to the status quo and to those people in charge, the people who are getting the bailouts, the people who are in the military industrial complex, the people who benefit from the Federal Reserve System. So those kind of attacks, uh, you know, don't, don't bother me at all. But that's part of what happens in, in politics. We would uh, expect that. And the higher up on the uh, ladder you go on uh, how you're rated in the polls, the more tax you get. Uh, WMUR, did you have a question? Dr. Paul, do you agree with Newt's assessment of Mitt Romney uh, spouting pious baloney? <laughs> I wouldn't use those words. <laughs> no, but I think I put them all in the same category. I, also, I, I think that all the candidates uh, support the status quo, and uh, they basically have been, uh, you know, in different sides of the issue. You know, I do get the negative charges made, but nobody has challenged me on being a flip-flopper. So uh, that, that doesn't occur. So, but I think they're all in that same, same uh, uh, category. Uh, they don't challenge the status quo. They've been part of the establishment. They don't have any real cuts. They're not challenging the foreign policy. They're not looking at the Federal Reserve. So I, I think uh, they're all very close together philosophically, and I think the country's looking for something completely different. Uh, where's, uh, channel, channel 7? Brian, channel who's seven. next? Channel back? 7, right over there. Channel 7. Hello, Dr. Paul. Our Suffolk University 7 News poll has you gaining on Mitt Romney. Was there a marked difference in the way that the other candidates and you went after him in last night's debate versus today? And will you concentrate on any one candidate, particularly him, in the coming days? Well, I'm going to concentrate on my message. That's what I've been concentrating on for 30 years. <laughs> 
But when the questions are asked, you know, uh, about individuals, you know, I'm not bashful. I usually, uh, if I'm up to speed and know exactly how they voted, I let people know. And I, I think too often they've been on both sides of these issues. And I think it's the message that is more powerful. It is important, even though it's not the most fun for me in, in politics, is to have to say, don't you know he did this and he did that. I'm much uh, more positive. I like to talk about, you, you know, the, the benefits of freedom, the benefits of the rule and law, the benefits of personal liberty and why we should have a wise foreign policy. I think that's what's winning the day for us. All right, time for one more question. Hey, Dr. Paul, Beth Fooley from AP. Let's say you, got, you came in third in Iowa. Let's say you don't beat Mitt Romney here, even if, you, if, you, if you're gaining. What is your plausible strategy for winning? How do you go down into South Carolina having gotten to come in third and then second? How do you, what's, your, what's your strategy to get the nomination? Well, I guess I'm not very good at answering questions like that about strategy because I keep thinking I do the same thing over and over again. <laughs> you know, my job is to understand the issues, understand the philosophy, understand American history, understanding economic policy, and explain it to people so they know what to expect and get them to join in uh, with what I'm doing by voting and electing me uh, to whatever office I run for. So. The strategy is to continue to do the same, but those individuals who help me in managing the campaign, you know, I rely on them to, to much of a degree on strategy, and that is they have to look at the books, they have to raise the money, they have to do direct mail, and, and uh, fortunately, that hasn't, they've had an easy job. They shouldn't get paid any money at all. <laughs> Because the money comes in sometimes spontaneously, and you have to have the money. But the big challenge is, obviously, even with us raising, I don't know how much, tens of millions, ten, twenty million dollars. To me, that's a lot of money. But when we're competing with somebody with a hundred million dollars, and we're talking about a president that might spend a, a billion dollars, I mean, this is, this is big time. So our strategy has to be that we have a wonderful message, which gets spontaneous support, at the same time, we have to do our very best to raise the money and compete in a normal fashion, which so far we've been able to do. We were in Iowa running a very conventional campaign. We're here. We've been here for a long time. I've been here frequently. And we're, you know, uh, doing a lot of phone calling and mail and advertising. So we have to continue to do this. And um, I think I will be in South Carolina rather soon, like uh, probably within 12 hours of knowing how we do up here. The one uh, beyond what? <coughs> what? What do you do well in New Hampshire? Which states can you do well in beyond? Beyond which? Which states to do well beyond New Hampshire? I hope all of them, but uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you know. Um, the, the, the caucus states, we are putting a little bit more emphasis in. and uh, But remains South Carolina will be a nice test for us because it's a bigger, sta big, uh, bigger state. And uh, if we do well there, that will encourage the fundraising. And, and, and it alerts other people to the message. They'll say, what is he talking about? You know, maybe we ought to look at that. Maybe he does have some answers. And that's already growing by leaps and bounds, the interest in the campaign. So... That's it, folks. Thanks for coming. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate everything you do. Thank you so much. People love you so much, sir. They've stole our, our sign we had. We had a big oh, Paul sign. Every, every state line between here and New Mexico. We're against theft. Yeah, I know, but they're very excited for it. I'm, I'm an independent voter, yes, sir, and I was wondering if I could ask you. I know you're against um, income tax, which is uh, put in by an amendment. Are there any other amendments you're against? And what's well, the other one is sort of one that people don't think about too often. That would be the 17th Amendment. Because the 17th Amendment, you know, we used to, the state legislatures used to pick our senators, mm -hmm. and they were to go up there and protect states' rights. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd send your two senators down and say that if the federal government's encroaching on New Hampshire, those those senators were supposed to vote so to protect the state. So you want to go back to the state I would, but, but that's, a lot of people are thoughtful about the tax issue, but that won't happen until you cut the size of the government down because they need right. revenue. The 17th Amendment would be another amendment. Some people feel that uh, 
the Republicans are trying to crack the, the losing the losing 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 losing